Because I, I remember, I think that you have different ways of dealing with failures depending on your stage of the career. I still remember the first time, I was not even first old, but I took it like so personally. The first rejection and all the comments of the reviewers that I cried. Right now, if I had to cry all the time taking rejections for papers, I'm like, what? I, so, so, if I think that now I laugh, Okay, so I think uh, I'll start with a general introduction before leaving the word to you, Nico, that you're the Perfect. chair. So for those who are new to BioRoom, BioRoom was started in April, if I'm not wrong, and uh, it had the goal to share some very short and an easy presentation for a broad biology audience. And the first edition was great. We were able not only to share great research in my opinion but also to create a nice very nice community and a lot of us were still here we're still discussing so if you see that some of us we are speaking to each other we are interacting to each other it's because we've been knowing each other for months now and we've been um, joining by a room every time uh, every week and now that we are in the second edition of by a room we thought that we could bring it to another level and we could expand it. So not only doing presentations, but also doing a part on career development that we're starting today. I'm very excited for this. This is completely new. This is an experiment and I'm sure it'll go great. And then we will do another part, the final one uh, in uh, science communication. So we have, we have also yeah. a lot of um, other exciting topics uh, to discuss. So with that, Today we have a session which is called How to be Happy in Academia. So I think a lot of us were curious um, to discuss about this. And we have a lot of experience to share. And of course, we encourage all of you to join the discussion. And one of the main things that we really want to point out is that this is a safe place. We usually, we speak very openly. Feel free to interrupt and to um, ask questions. And then I will leave now the word to Nico so he will explain how this session will be. And thank you very much, Nico, to be a chair. Um, Elia is the co-organizer of this uh, with me. Do you want to add something, Elia, before Nico starts? Yeah, let's have fun all together. I mean, I got late, so I don't really know what I should add. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so please, Nico. Go ahead and explain it. Okay, thank you so much, Carmen and Elia, for the opportunity and everybody uh, for being here. So my name is Nicolas. I'm a PhD candidate um, in anthropology at Stony Brook University in New York. And I was born and raised in Argentina. And this is my fourth year living in the United States. So um, today I'm really proud to present and conduct the first panel of, the new, of this new section of BioRoom, which is and known this section as career development. So this panel actually was um, originated after brainstorming with many of the people here about learning from our mistakes to become a happier and more successful um, person in academia. So uh, for you guys that you are not doing uh, this, you can follow me um, on Twitter. And um, we're gonna be using uh, the chat also as well. So I would like to introduce uh, the different topics of this panel, and then we will have approximately eight to seven minutes to discuss uh, each topic. So I'm going to be timing this so we can have a good talk, but just you know, uh, conserve in the amount of time that we have. And we will provide live uh, summary feed for our discussion that I'm uh, popping right here in the chat, so you can actually click there. And you can access that so you can have like a, the key take home messages from this panel as we are talking live. All right, this is the first time this is gonna be exploratory, but I mean, I hope everything is going great. So let's get started. So the first part of this panel is related to the relationship between you and your advisor. 
okay? So since we have people at different stages of their careers here, please be free to talk about your own experience as a student and also as a mentor, okay? So the first question is related to how we chose and have chosen in the past our advisors and mentors. So in terms of the, you know, how to choose someone that you actually don't know yet. So what are the characteristics that you're looking for and how to be sure about choosing someone that is good for you or is a good fit before actually knowing him or her meaningfully? Anybody wants to start with their experience? I, I, I can start. I, I feel free to start. And I have shared this on Twitter and I have shared this many times. So people who know me know this, know, know this about me. So I'm not worried. So I'm very good at explaining how to choose a good mentor because I chose the wrong one for my PhD. So I know very well how to do things wrong, apparently. Luckily, I learned from the mistakes, so now I'm doing my postdoc. So for everyone who doesn't know me, I, I am Carmen too, but you can tell me Carmen too, actually, if you want. And uh, I work at Virginia Tech. I'm, in, I'm now in my... I've, two years and a half in in my postdoc. And um, I did my PhD in Spain. So first of all, you need to think that in my opinion, Spain and the US, they have like very different academy culture or that is my impression. And I have to say that even if people always say that America is like more hardworking and everything, I have to say that for me, it has been much more, it has been happier in here than in there. So what do I have to say about my mentor? So I think that there's not like, a, there are good mentors and bad mentors. I'm not going to discuss that. But what I'm talking about this, what we're talking about, about today, it's about having the right fit, the right match. And it's like finding like a partner for your life. You know, it's like, like a marriage in some way. And, and my mentor was a very good person my mentor for the PhD, I, he always supported me in the personal struggles that I found and he really wanted to help me. But we didn't understand each other. We didn't have the same vision of science. We didn't have the same vision of how things had to be done. And that made me feel that made me very, very unhappy because he was very a good mentor for other people in my lab that found that he was a great mentor and advised other students to come. So I thought that there was something wrong with me that I was not being a good scientist or anything. So that made me feel very frustrated. And that made me feel that I was not good for academia and this was not my place. And now I'm living exactly the opposite experience in academia. I have a great mentor, I love her, but she's not great for everyone. There are people in my lab that they are not happy with how she does things. And, are, and I think that's going to be always the case. I think that the one important thing is to really have a good person as a mentor and later trying to find the match. So you need to really ask yourself what you're looking for. I mean, do you want a young mentor? Do you want an old mentor and why? And understand why you want one person that is in the middle term of their careers, uh, which is the person's opinion about life and, and the work balance. What do they think about, your, about that? It's a person that really... How, how does this person mentor you? Is it going to give you freedom or is it going to really ma micromanage every action that you are taking? Or it's more like a middle term. And also what you want, because maybe when you're starting your PhD, you're more looking for something that is like more guided. And later when you're more in your postdoc, it's like more independent or the opposite. It can also, the opposite can also work. You, maybe you, you, you want to have more freedom when you're a PhD and later in your post you want to focus only on being productive and give, be much more guided. I think that both things work, but you really need to choose that. And my advice, the most important one, is ask the people in the lab. Ask them what is the worst effect that that PI has. Because sometimes people in the lab have trouble to bad mouth about their bosses, especially with people they don't know and they are not in confidence. But if you ask, oh, which, which one would you, do you think it's like the worst defect that the person has? They may, might say something nee nice, but you need to read between the lines and try to understand what they actually mean. Because 
PIs are not perfect. They are people. Of course, they are not perfect, but we are not perfect either. So I, we cannot expect them to be perfect. And at least that, that, that's my opinion. I want to comment on, on this last thing that you can ask people in the lab and you can ask if possible people that left the lab already for whatever reason, like either they became PI themselves or they left the lab for other reasons that you don't know. Because like Carmen said, sometimes people that are still in the lab, they're not comfortable in, in speaking openly to you about their current PI and you will not get that much information out of that or at least not that much sincere information. If you can speak to former alumni of that lab, that would be even better. Um, so yeah, this is not something that I did, but if I went back, definitely that is something that I would do. Yeah, you know, like that bias is always there and you have to, yeah, you know, somewhat navigate that. Uh, thank you so much, both of you, Carmens, for for their um, experience. And what do you think, guys? The, the the guys that are in Europe, do you think there is a kind of like a difference between the American system and the European system in terms of how mentors or advisors engage with their with their students? I guess I can talk about that since I'm in Europe, and then I can give the European perspective as a PhD. Um, it's definitely different here, especially when you're choosing the PhD itself. It's more like a, a job interview than it is that you're just choosing a, a program. So in most cases, whenever you do go for a PhD in Europe and you get to the interview stage, you already know that you have everything that it takes to be there. Like you're smart enough and you have all the credentials. So that's not why you're there. When you're in that interview, uh, what you're doing is seeing if you fit with the person, like if you fit in the lab and it's just as much as uh, they're seeing if you fit with them as you are seeing if you fit with your supervisor. So in that sense, that interview is your way of figuring out if you fit in the lab, if you can have a, a nice talk with that person or if it's a bit awkward, like, that, that's the point where you have to decide, okay, this is someone I can work with or not, which can be a bit quick, but yeah, it's like any other job really. Um, I was wondering before like starting the PhD, would you recommend to do a short rotation or internship lab to actually get to know like the group and the group leader? Yeah, that's my question. <laughs> So I can actually give my opinion on that. I think that, you know, as much time as you can get before, you know, giving a firm decision on where to go, it, of course, is going to, to help you have a more appropriate uh, choice making process. Um, it's not always possible. You know, I know that there are some programs that specifically ask you to pass maybe I don't know, from free labs that you want, you have one month, one month, one month. I know that UK does a lot of that. Yeah, it's definitely not everywhere. I'm sure it's a plus, I think. Uh, what you can do usually, and most of the people agree to do that, is you know to have a, a whole day visit, uh, which could be a lot of time. It could actually not be a lot of time. It also depends, you know, how many people are maybe in the lab and you usually want absolutely to spend time with uh, all of them. This has been said more or less by all the people that already said something. Uh, actually, I think that if you are not allowed to get access to everyone in the lab or as many people as possible, this is kind of a red flag. To say mm, maybe there's something here that I wouldn't really like to, to find out later. And, and it's about making more or less as much uh, as you can from the short time you have to talk with people. And as also the other said, it's, you don't have to feel that if you don't fit in a lab, it's because you maybe are inappropriate. You know, there's definitely a good place and a good time and a good combination of people. If you just don't fit in the lab, don't force it, because then you're just going to have a bad time. And maybe if I just can give a small practical advice on the 
short interaction that you will have with these people when you go for an interview. If you want to know something, try maybe to put your question in a more open manner rather than uh, like, have you had a good time here? Because according to some of the people tendency, they will try to, you know, agree with that positive statement or disagree just because of how they are as a character and not because of how they feel. You know, there's always the person that tries to, let's say, accommodate the, the person they are interacting to. And maybe they mean something else. So maybe just ask, you know, something more open, like how has your time been here? And you're probably going to get a more uh, true answer to, to, to what they really believe. I think too, there's, even if you can't get a ton of time with the PI, there's some sleuthing you can do online and through looking at their papers and the way they give talks as well. Like, are they the kind of PI who has the picture of the person who did the work on the slide? Are they acknowledging each of those people? Does it look like a lot of people in the lab get authorship or is it just a couple of people on each paper? Does it seem as though they always have um, corresponding authorship or do they put the first author as a corresponding author as well? Um, each of those things tell you a little bit about the way that PI regards the people within their lab and how much they want their people to be successful and how much they trust their opinion and give them credit. And all of that's really important, even if you don't get a ton of time in the lab to talk to them, each of these things will tell you something about the person you're gonna work for. Yeah, that's really interesting, uh, Melissa, thank you so much. Carmen, you, you were trying to say something? Which Carmen? Go we, ahead, I go guess. ahead. We were both also. trying to say something. Go ahead, um, Carmen. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carmen. So uh, I wanted to add something about the training and about the rotation. I think uh, Kira Hoffler, if I'm, it's, that's how you pronounce it, right? Yeah, I think she made a very good point. That is, how can I really know the lab? So I have to say also, again, from my experience, because as I said before, I did everything wrong. So... I did the rotation with the lab. I did two rotations in summer with the lab and I did the master in, uh, thesis in the lab. So I did everything there. So theoretically, I should know what was going on, but it wasn't the case because my project was more challenging than others because the topic was very out of the knowledge, the, the expertise of the PI. So how he reacted against the challenges was something that I didn't know at that time. So more than how much time you can spend in the lab is what should I look like? What should I look at to really understand what, how the lab works and which are the challenges and which are the struggles that people find working with this person, working between them? I, I think that that's more key. And then something, for instance, I didn't, I didn't know. I knew that the person was good, but didn't know how it was going to be to work with a project that was not working and was going to be very challenging and was out of the expertise. So I think that that was something I didn't know at the time, and I would advise all the students to also pay attention to. So not only about the environment, not only about the PI, but also about how they handle the problems when they arise. And a huge difference also between at least Spain and the US is how much money you have for doing research. That's something that counts because it's how stressed people are. So how stressed you are if you something wrong, how stressed you are if you need to purchase a, an antibody and later it doesn't work and you're spending your money on this. And that also put much more pressure in the environment at the lab because of that. So that's also something that doesn't sound good, but maybe you should also check which is the funding that the person has and how much money they have, because how you are going to perceive everything is going to change too in, based on that. And it sounds like something you would never think of when you're doing your bachelor, but later there are things that count and are going to make you suffer more or less. And it's not nice to say that because we shouldn't judge a, a mentor or a PI according to the money they get, but it can change also your experience. Thank you so much, Carmen. That was uh, extremely good advice. So deeply related to all this, uh, you know, discussion and conversation, what happen to you and what advice can you please give us if it's not a very good relationship and you need to switch advisors do you guys have experience with that how did you manage that what are the pieces of advice that you can give related to switch 
advisor? If I could go back, I would change advisor without any kind of doubt. I mean, I would have done it before. And as I'm saying, sometimes you are scared of what people are going to think about me in the program or in the institute where I am or in my CV, how is that going to look? And I think that's stupid because at the end, I'm sure that I would have done much better in productivity and in every other point of view if I changed it. Because at the end, it was bad for him, but bad for me because he was not happy with me and I was not happy with him. So who's winning here? No one's winning here with this situation. So I wish that in academia, we were more encouraging the good match between the people. And we, I, I, I really hope that we could say, okay, if this person isn't right for you, you should change. And I would like to see PhD programs in America that have much more, organi- it's more organized than in Europe, in my opinion. I would like to see like people saying openly and loud, you can change and it's fine. It's going to be fine for everyone. And there's not a penalization. It's not like something that's going to be punishing you the rest of your career. I have a curiosity on this because I also did a PhD in Italy and I I had the I mean I had a, a beautiful experience with my mentor actually. So I had a great fit, but like Carmen said, some other people in the lab they didn't. So perhaps they spent a lot of years complaining and that was not healthy for the lab environment, not healthy for them. It was just because sometimes people are not compatible. But I have the feeling that in Europe is this thing of changing mentor is done less than here. I mean, it's like more blamed. I don't know if that's true. What What do you guys think both here in the US and in Europe? But what kind of feeling do you have about that? So, yeah. can, yes, can I? I did my PhD in Italy too. I'm mm-hmm. Christina for people who don't know me. And I now I'm doing the fast talk uh, here in Blacksburg, Virginia Tech, like Carmen, the other one. The other Carmen 2.1. Carmen Spain. Uh, Carmen Spain, yeah. Um, so I have to say that it's very true that um, in at least in Italy, it's very hard to change your mentor because it doesn't seem to be a nice thing to do. And people are very, it's, a, it's sad to say, but it, they are very vindicative. So it won't be good for your career if you change mentor while here it seems a very accepted thing so good for who is doing a phd in the u.s so they yeah, can USA. Just... <laughs> at least for this yeah that is at, least, good. at least for this i would say yeah yeah no, because I, I think it's also this in my country i don't know in, in in the netherlands for instance or in germany where they have more money for research it's like you feel thankful that they are allowing you to be in the lab somehow you're like owing yeah. something your PI, even if they are great or whatever, you feel that way. So it's like you're betraying him for changing when it's not good for anyone. I agree. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I share the exact same experience, not in my PhD because I'm doing currently doing my PhD here in the US, but I did my bachelor's degree in Argentina and it's exactly as Carmen, uh, the Spanish Carmen is saying, is that you feel uh, with a huge depth of and, and really thankful for being there. And it's something that, you know, it's a, we are doing a service to them as well. So it's, it's a win-win combination or it's supposed to be a win-win combination with your advisor. But as any, uh, you know, um, human interaction, you can have a good fit or a bad fit and it shouldn't be a problem to change advisors in the, pro- in the process. So now, now I would like to switch the focus a little bit to the way you have to evaluate your own performance, right? So in terms of self-evaluation, how do you guys think the academic system is impacting in our ability to, to self-evaluate and how this can affect our mental health, which is a huge and really important issue. And we're gonna be developing a special uh, segment of this uh, section on my room in the future. And the other thing that I was wondering is how can you actually measure your own productivity and satisfaction with your own work? So if uh, everyone is shy, maybe I will kick the ball because I have kind of a theory which I'm seeing more and more confirmed and which is simple as that is that the academic environment trains people you know, to, in order to be a good scientist, in order to be a good academic, 
most of your important evaluation or all of your important value is usually coming from other people's assessment. So we are somehow very, very smart people that get trained to uh, not trust us at all. And I think this can have, you know, this can lead to some kind of bad places. And uh, because if you lose, you know, this kind of freedom, this ability of saying, I am capable of doing this. I have improved in doing that on your own. It doesn't mean that these are things that other people should recognize that you have, you know, improved on or that you're capable of. It should really be you that you have to take what you do, what you know, and say, this is value. This is something that makes me good at what I do or uh, something that, you know, has improved me as a person. So I have become more and more sensible, let's say, to uh, to this topic. Uh, So I don't know what you have uh, any kind of thought about, uh, about this, if you want to add something. So actually, I have something to say. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank Hi, you Moore. for letting me join in. Uh, I am Mor. I'm from Israel. I think I'm the only representative of <laughs> the Middle East in this group. There was, uh, there was Joy that is not joining in us uh, now, but there was Joy from Lebanon. Mm. Though she left Lebanon recently. Yeah, she yeah, left but it. Very welcome. Too. You should join more times. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm actually really trying to to follow. The hours are a bit uh, different here. Mm-hmm. So I'm doing my PhD at the Weizmann Institute. Uh, and actually, there was something I recently encountered that really helped me to change uh, perspective about self-evaluation. Um, so there is this very famous talk of uh, Uri Alon. He's also from the Weizmann about the cloud in TED. I don't know if you know it. But um, so I think one of the problems that academia uh, causes in self-evaluation is that science is uh, presented as something very rational and there is always like a reason to do something and then you do it and then you get something out of it. But no one is talking about the fact that the scientific process is highly emotional and uh, very often um, it generates those feelings of uh, feeling unworthy and uh, feeling like you're, you don't know what you're doing. But it's just because people don't talk about the fact that this is part of doing science. And this is exactly what um, they highlight in this talk. I can send the link uh, later in the chat that it's like it's predicted that you will hit this phase when you don't know what to do. It just it just predicted it will happen as part of the process, but no one is talking about it. And then when you hit it, you think it's because of you and you think it's because you're unworthy and because you don't know what you're doing. And it's just because we're not communicating this enough as part of the process. And, um, and, and after like watching this, I realized how often something like this happens and if we were just more open about it and just talk about it more and be more aware that this is something that is part of the process, then all of this frustration and feeling of unworthiness would not uh, affect us this much. So this is something that I learned and I will share the link now in the chat and I really recommend to watch it. It's really reassuring. I think that is a great point. I'm very curious to, to watch this uh, video. And I was also thinking that that is something and probably one of the first thing that I learned about research was that you give like more than a thousand, you get back one. So that is something that I was, I always tell, I always tell my students now where I have like people to train in the lab, like do not feel bad if you are going towards failures because that is the normal thing in, in research. That is. The, the normal thing to, to that we have to embrace and then it's worth it to keep doing research if for that one 
per thousand uh, times that it works, that it, it's great and that it's worth it. And that gives us the satisfaction. And then of course, there are some moments in which everything goes well and some other moments in which everything goes bad, but that is like not something that depends sometimes, most of the times on us. So I, I definitely agree we should, I mean, it's easier to say than to do, but uh, we should keep it in mind that we should not get frustrated over the failure or, yeah, these kind of things. Uh, I totally agree with you. And I would like to say that what I personally do when I feel like shit is calling one of my best science friends and talk with them because what's happening is that I'm being so hard on myself while they can let me not let me down right and I talk and I talk with different people according to what the what the problem is and I think it's very important to have friends in academia for this reason because honestly my best friends they're not in academia they cannot understand what I'm going through every day it's not the same. They have no idea. They have no clue. So you really need to have, and I think it's very important to have a group like this to share this kind of things. Because like who else would be so prepared on this topic, right? Another very important thing that I want to highlight about the mental health. I think it's very important to ask every day to ourselves if we are still happy to do this. Because if we're not happy anymore, there is no reason to continue to do this. It's not a failure to say, hey, I'm going to be a consultant. I'm going to go to a company. I'm going to work in a pharmacy. It doesn't matter as long as you're happy. And if that happiness is not with you every day while you're doing research, it's better to really take the opportunity to change your life. Like, hey... I've seen that with a friend who is struggling so much in being very far from home to do research. And also, she's also not very happy about how her postdoc is going. And honestly, I'm telling her, hey, if this is not what you want to do, it's not a failure to say, I'm going back in my country and I'm going to do nine to five work that is not giving me so much psychological pressure. Yeah, I just wanted to share this with you. Okay, so I just wanted to say that we call it from academia, we call it alternative paths, alternative careers. And then it's like for someone that really wants to change, it sounds bad, it sounds a little bit judgmental and, and it should not be like that. Those are like just other parts. It, it's, it's, not like alternative to something that it seems like that you failed in something and that you didn't want to go on with academia. So that is totally something to keep it in mind. Yes, absolutely. And sorry. Yeah, no, thank you for, for allowing me, Nicolas. What I was saying is, first of all, I, I called Christina when I, the other day I was called her. I think I'm going to leave my, my postdoc. I'm not doing well. I'm not going to make it. So I, I, Christina, poor girl, has to listen to me like, complain about life but the point i was trying to make is that i think that they're also in academia there's something that is believing that to be a scientist you need to be a genius because you know even elia was taking hey how smart we all are i mean you don't need to be super smart to be a scientist you can be average and it's fine you know you need to be passionate about what you're doing and you want you need to want to find the answers but i think it's super toxic saying people if you're not ultra smart you don't belong here and i think that there's like this way where they are presenting scientists in, 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 in the media and everywhere saying, oh yeah, you need to be a genius, you need to be so smart, this person is like brilliant, whatever. You know what? It's fine if you're not brilliant. I think we should finish with that too. I think we should finish with this idea that we are not great. And the other thing we should finish with, it's comparison. But because all our system is based on comparison. If we get funded or not, if we publish or not. I mean, everything is comparing, comparing, comparing. So we keep comparing ourselves to people that make us feel worse. We don't look at them for inspiration, that it's totally fine as what we should do. But we compare them. And also, even worse, we compare their endpoint to our pathway until we reach our endpoint, let's say. 
So that is like super toxic. So I think if there's something that we need to eliminate, it's like this way of comparing people and make them feel that this person is more valuable than these other because they did this or that. And I think that that's totally wrong. And I'm saying, and I really believe it, it's like what makes you a great scientist is not your your mental capacity necessarily. It's also how you face the struggle that is you're going to find every, every day. You never surrender. and the passion to answer the questions in science. I don't think it's only about intelligence. Intelligence helps, let's be honest. I'm not going to say, oh yeah, no, no, it helps. But there are many other things that make a good scientist and are not only about intelligence. And we don't need to be a genius to be a scientist. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to comment on that. I totally agree with with Carmen. Like, uh, my PhD took me 10 years, which is a very long time. But I know that you know, I had my own challenges, the resources were limited, my project was difficult, and it was very, very easy to compare myself to others that were being more successful or were producing more. So I absolutely agree that it's very hard, but don't try not to compare yourself with others because your path is your path and you only have your own, like, you know, opportunities, challenges, extra duties. Like there is so much involved in your, uh, in, in, in your journey. So yeah, I, I just wanted to super support that. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about comparison too. I also want to just add some really cool advice I got from a postdoc when I was an undergrad. When you're thinking about what labs to join and what programs to go to, you always have to keep in mind too that when you are kind of feeling a little bit of regret, it might also be that you are comparing the real life experience of where you currently are with how you imagine things might be somewhere else. And if you had gone to that other place, you probably would be feeling the same way at this moment. Now, it's important to know where the boundary is. There is a place at which it's no longer sustainable or healthy to be where you are at, but no matter where you go, you're gonna be unhappy at some point. You're gonna feel a little bit of regret at some point. Things aren't gonna go well at some time and just keep in mind that you would feel that way elsewhere too. And it's just important to keep moving forward if you can. Can I maybe just uh, end with a couple of, let's say slightly provocative question on this, which is, do you think that if you fail a paper or fail an application, you know, your friends or the people that say you care about uh, will still like you and will still love you? And the second thing is, do you think also this matters to determine how valuable you are as a person? Because it really shouldn't. You should be able to say this yourself. This is, I think, more or less what I was also trying to say before. That it's like, we are smart people, but I'm not saying this is like we are smarter than others. I'm just saying that, you know, we are just capable. And because of that, we should uh, be able to say, okay, this is good. This is value. And as uh, I don't remember who said, you know, struggle will always come. And there will always be a moment when, you know, something fails and something, etc. And yeah, you can, you know, try and let's say resist until that, uh, lucky you no know, paper comes in and finally you get accepted by other people uh, but I don't think that's really sustainable no because again you know this is something that maybe happens once and then you have a lot of time when it doesn't happen so you need something that you know helps you determine how you are as a person in those let's say gap of time uh, because you really shouldn't need the evaluation of others to, to say okay I'm good because otherwise you have you won't really work, you won't really uh, click until the end, I don't know. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, like the most important thing about that is that those are the two sides of the same coin, right? How someone else values yourself and how do you value yourself, okay? So it's, I, 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 con I conceive this as, as a general thing that is all on the same uh concept right so and in relation to that concept of being happy that uh, more started introducing so i was really wondering and it is interesting for me to learn how 
you take those things that you were mentioning, such as failure, uh, unexpected things, and unhappiness, on a on a positive way and a constructive way. So, in a short uh, question, how do you deal with failure? I'll, I'll talk about that. <laughs> so failure is going to happen eventually to everyone because that's part of our job. And sooner or later, something's going to go wrong. And if it doesn't, then people are probably going to investigate what you're doing because they're going to be suspicious. Um, what helps a lot is like what we talked about before as well, is that you have friends, academic friends, preferably, who know what you're doing. Uh, or just like people at your department or whatever, a group you, you lunch with, something like that. And then just vent. Because sometimes it, you just have a bad day and everything sucks and then you just have to be angry about it. They don't have to solve a problem. They don't, they don't have to fix it for you. You just need to listen. It's all you need most of the time. And then you can just get right back to it. And it can be to friends, but I mean, you can also vent on Twitter. It's very good for venting. Or, or any other way, as long as you just get it out and just let yourself feel it, because yeah, it's, it's, it's bad and it sucks and it'll be over again soon and the next time we'll be luckier. If I can add something to this, I think that what Elia was saying before is like, okay, you're here, you did everything you had to do to arrive here when you're starting your PhD, right? So one of the problems is that we were such good students that we didn't deal with failure constantly. So it's something that it's almost new to us when we arrived to academia. And it's a new learning that other people has been learning since they were in elementary school and we face for the very first time. And we are like 20 something. And it's like, what is wrong? This was not who was me. So you even have like a identity crisis trying to figure out who's this new person making mistakes and making things kind of, wrong, kind of work. And, 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 and you feel like really it's like something more than it actually is. And I think that the most important part of PhD is learning to fail much, especially when you were a great student, you had like straight A's and everything is like, yeah, now I need to fail and this is the new me and I fail and that's how I keep growing. But maybe you didn't fail until you arrived there and that's a, the worst lesson you need to learn. I, I think this is very important. Sorry, who was probably some, okay. Um, because I, I remember, I think that you have different ways of dealing with failures depending on your stage of the career. So I remember, I still remember the first time and I was in, in my undergrad and we said almost to start the PhD because I did the PhD in the same lab of my undergrad. Um, and we were, we sent our first paper, our first manuscript. I, I was not even like first author, I was like second author, but I took it like so personally. The first rejection and, and all the comments of the reviewers that I cried. <laughs> and uh, right now, if I had to cry all the time, I get rejections for papers. I'm like, what? <laughs> I, so, so if I think now, now I laugh and I'm very relaxed about that and I know about rejections rate and everything and I think all the people especially the early career researchers right now here in this chat they should know that it's all like normal <laughs> like, and then you will get used to it like like Carmen said and it's very true uh, you have to learn to how to uh to copy with that and and that takes time they take just a lot of rejections, I guess, so, and a lot of failures. Um, before I was in academia, I actually was a swimmer. I, I swam back in college for Florida State. I was on Team USA for a little bit. Um, and one of the things that I learned from swimming is that, like, that's a sport where you fail every day, all the time, constantly. <laughs> like, you, you only go faster than you did before when you're tapered, which happens once a year. You have to be really lucky in that moment. Like I went four or five years straight without ever going faster than I did before. And I think what you have to learn when you fail that consistently is that there is a something you can learn from every failure and something that you're looking for that isn't necessarily like the definition of succeeding. Like there's one piece that you can make better or one comment you're really looking for or something that you get out of it that improves the work 
in the end. And if you can think of it in that way, it's not actually failure, you're growing, you're gaining something from this experience of getting these comments back or sending this paper out and having and learning what people in other fields think. It's hard to maintain that thought all the time. And I'm certainly not great at it every day. Like the first day I'm really like annoyed at the comments that come back. And then the next day I get into this mindset, but it's just important to remember that these things help you learn and grow. If I could say something about failure and mindsets, sometimes like we think that our failures are bigger or worse than they are in real life because we care so much about what we do um but if we just took like a day off or a good night's sleep <laughs> we can change our mindset just realize that not uh yeah a small failure or a way to learn something new it's not we are not the failure it's just a little like delay in our path i can maybe do a second sport metaphor you know i like maybe to compare uh, learning from failure like uh, what you usually do in something like boxing so if you go on a match you know you're gonna get punched it's gonna happen anyway so what you can learn and what you can change or what you can control more or less is you know the probability of that thing to happen so uh, a lot of times you know people say you you can have success uh, also because of luck uh, it's true also but you know that can happen once in a million time but what you can do is to prepare for when luck eventually is available in you know, order to get it. So, and this is more or less what, more or less what you do for something like, uh, like boxing. So you know that you got punched a lot on one side. So then you do something to decrease the chances for that happening again. And then maybe the next time you go on the ring, then you get lucky that you don't get punched enough on that side. So in a way, yeah, this is more or less also what happens uh, in, uh, you know, with paper or with um, brands or whatever. You know, you, you never know that the person that is judging you will really, really not like what you write because that can happen and you cannot have control on that because we are still talking about people even if, uh, you know, it should be highly trained people. But it's, it's other people, so you don't have control on that but you can eventually do the things correctly so that when the you no know, lucky shot comes in yeah that's a really good uh insight Elia. thank you so much so guys to wrap this great panel up i would love to hear your personal recommendations and and tips regarding the skills and activities to manage the stress and anxiety from these really highly competitive and challenging work environment. So I think that a common point across the, the entire panel today is that, I mean, let's be real, we are in a really highly competitive environment. So uh, a good thing about successful is doesn't have to be a detriment for your own personal health and mental health and also your happiness, which are extremely important. So I am really eager to learn what are your personal um, recommendations regarding to that. I can jump in again if nobody else wants to. So it's not really necessarily one specific skill or something that you need to learn to be happy in academia, I guess. But I think it's important to just have something that you like, something that you enjoy and that you allow yourself to end the workday so that if it's possible, just set a certain time, like five or six or whenever, and then you're done. If most of the things that we're doing, they don't really need to be done specifically that day. There's very few things that cannot wait until the next day. And then you just stop working and you go home and you just enjoy the evening because you're done for the day. And then do something you like, do, do a hobby. If you want to do sports, you do sports. If you want to sit there and watch Netflix for an entire evening, do that. Just unwind and 
not think about work. Because if you go from work straight to bed, you're going to sleep bad. And then the next morning, it's also not going to be well. And it's just going to, it's just going to get worse and worse. So that's what I would, would recommend. Just have something you enjoy. Ha- allow yourself to have a life. Five minutes, stop being so wise, please. I feel embarrassed. <laughs> I wanted to say something. I mean, sometimes the important thing is, I do this, I do science. For me, it's not just a job, you know? For me, it's not that. For other people, it is, and it's not like a judgment to other people that perceive it in a different way. When they say, oh, it's a nine to five job as another one. For me, it's my passion. It's my purpose in life. So I have the purpose written in front of me and I read every day. And I say, I do this because I want to contribute with a meaningful discovery to understanding of the human brain. That's what I want to do. That's what my final goal is. And that's what I do every day to try to arrive to that goal, you know, and it's very pretentious or whatever. I don't care. That's my purpose. And I look at it every day and I say, I try to reconnect to, to with my mission and what brought me here and why I'm doing what I'm doing, why I'm in here. So even if I struggle, there's a reason why I choose this battle and I choose this struggle every day and that makes me happy. And the other thing that helps a lot is conferences. Go and listen to the awesome things that people are doing around the world. It's like, oh, wow. I mean, that really makes me want to go back to the lab and keep going and keep moving. And now it's being hard because there are no conferences you can go. And they're online and it's not exactly the same, but that helped me in the past. I'm going to say something slightly controversial. Sometimes perhaps it helps to care a little bit less, <laughs> like to, to not be so pissed when something really does not work. And just like Fabian said, just go home and relax, do something else. Do not get stuck on, on that thing because it's not going to help. And then day after, week after, going to do you're going to be proactive you know that you've been in the past so there's no reason to worry that much in that exact moment i think another piece of it is um to make sure that you design your experiments in a way where the answer is this or that or yes or no like you actually get an answer no matter what way the experiment comes out because the most frustrating thing is if you keep repeating it looking for something and that might make you biased in the end too. So I think um, a mistake some people make, especially early on, is that they hop right into whatever experiment they think without really planning what it is that they're about to do. And I think the, the more time you spend up front on the planning end and determining what these different outcomes could be, the better off you'll be in the end and the happier you'll be with the data that you get. Um, so just give yourself the space and time to, to determine what the right experiment is. And I think it makes you happier in the long run. If I may add something very quick on this last thing that you said, my former PhD mentor, he, he gave me one of the best suggestions when I was leaving the lab because I was like always working. I liked it a lot and I didn't feel it. It was like too much pressure, but actually probably it was, I mean, I was forcing myself to, to work more than necessary, I think. And now I realize it during my postdoc, like taking breaks and, and, and not working in the weekends, for instance, uh, I like it more. I mean, I, I need more balance, but it is like just personal view. But he said, because he, he was the one telling me like, uh, slow down. And he told me, I really hope that during your postdoc, you will realize uh, how much it is important to like take a break and just do nothing. Like just think or just like spend one entire day in just reading. Do not like, like you said, like do not jump from one experiment to the other. Just work, work, work uh, at the bench. Just find, allow yourself for a little bit of peace and that will help you a lot. So I always like keep that in mind and that is really a valid um, suggestion, yeah. I have uh, maybe a kind of provocative question to Carmen Munoz, but don't take it personally because I think I can like safely address uh, this type of question to anyone who would say something uh, like that. Which is, so you were saying, you know, that, you think that uh, your work, you know, is uh, like your purpose and 
uh, that you really want to make an impact and etc. And I'm going to make a question with, and I'm already saying sorry if I make this question, which is what happens if you can't? What happens if you don't manage to? No, yeah, now you're muted. Now you muted me. <laughs> sorry, go on. Okay. I'm muting at the I same time. I will try. I will try. <laughs> no, the same what I was trying to say is that the fact that you have a purpose doesn't mean that you cannot change it during your life. I mean, I have that purpose today, but if I get tired of it, I will change and I will read out of it. And if it doesn't work for me anymore, then I should change and that's all. So I reevaluate and try to reconnect to it. Can I do it? Can I really, this still excites me and that still makes me happy and everything. Yes, yeah, so I'll keep doing and I will make the effort and I will come tomorrow again and I will face the struggle again tomorrow. I mean, the fact that you have that and that purpose in life doesn't mean that it has to work for all your life, right? You are only finding like a reason behind the shit experiment that happened today. That is what I'm trying to say. Is there something bigger that you want to achieve? And that is what I refer by purpose. And I was, I was saying before, I want to make this very clear. When I was talking about the nine to five thing and everything, what I'm, and what I'm trying to say is that this is not an office work where you have a repetitive work to do. This is a creative thing. So there are going to be days where you need to put 12 hours. There are going to be days that you don't need to go to the lab and, and you need to go home and just go and have a walk and try to think about the things. And that's fine. I don't agree with the fact that this is a regular job doing nine to five. It's a creative work, job. You cannot expect a writer to say, yeah, you're going to write your novel from nine to five because that's not how it works. And that's how we should understand science. We need to really go beyond. We're creating things, we're creating ideas. So you cannot, it's very difficult to do it in a nine to five. I don't want to say it's impossible because my PhD, the, the, the person who was doing the PhD at the same time I was, he did it. But normally it's not the case and there's nothing wrong about it either. It gives you more freedom on the other hand, you can decide your schedule, you can decide how you do things. You can take the breaks when you need the break because you need it. So I just wanted to make clear, I'm not suggesting that you should do 80 hours a week or anything like that. I'm saying that it's not a regular job. It's a special job and I like it because of that. Have you, um, is anyone familiar with um, Alexandre Carmou? He's a French philosopher uh, who made a great dissertation of the myth of uh, Zephyrus, which is this uh, mythological figure that was uh, condemned to roll a stone up a cliff for eternity, right? And so Alexandre Camus, um, you know, revisited this myth and uh, stated that uh, Zephyrus found peace in this task, you know, every step that he was taking, even if it was, you know, like a repetitive and kind of meaningless uh, thing that he was doing, but he, uh, you know, probably found peace and calm in doing uh, this thing because this becomes your your word, you know, this becomes your your meaning, even if it's something that, well, apparently has no meaning because it's, you know, it's a repetitive thing. So nothing. I want to just to conclude this uh, this comment with you. Yeah, that is that is great, Elia. Thank you so much. So guys, we are um, approaching the the hour of the panel. So I would love to to know if you guys have any other you know uh, advice or recommendation. And if you, uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to share something uh, just to end and wrap up this panel, even on some previous stuff. Yeah, I, I, the only thing I would say is like, it's awesome that we are doing this because this thing should be more shared in academia and we should discuss more openly about them, especially with people that are starting. And I'm very happy we're doing this. And I hope that this set us like a press, uh, how say, uh, the stage to continue doing this more times with more people and try to learn from other people's mistakes. As I'm saying, I did so many that if I only keep them for myself, it's going to be a waste. Yeah, absolutely, Carmen. That is the whole point of doing this and start, you know, reaching out to people and start sharing our experiences. So thank you so much. That is the, the objective of all this. Yeah, I agree. And I think that like, I, I like so much to see new faces here and I really hope that you can stay the, the following uh, meetings too because this way we get to know each other and we're really forming a community which is one of the main purposes of all this like sharing 
difficulties and also joys and who knows perhaps sometimes i'm going to be in the netherlands and i'm going to ask fabian do you want to go for a tea or uh, something like that you know so i think that is really nice to have this network of people um all around the world and i, and I think there are a lot of positive vibes yeah carmen well thank you so much so guys uh, i think that everything is is is, is done for for today we're going to be uh joining uh, during the next week on the on the second session of this new section of my room. Do you, Carmen or Elia, has some final words to share? I just posted again the the Word document, that the shared document, so that if people want to save the link, do it now, because otherwise Zoom just deletes it after. But then um, if you want, you can also message the Bio Room uh, Twitter account if you want to see the document and I will send you via email. So it's not lost. Uh, we have it. It's just that I don't have all of your emails. I just have the emails of people that act as a speaker. But we will share it also on YouTube uh, when we will post this on YouTube, right? So you can go back and, and share it also with colleagues or friends that wanted to know what we spoke about today. Okay, guys, it was a pleasure to be with you during this hour. So I hope I can see you all of you uh, during the next session. Okay, so have a wonderful day, and I'll see you soon. Thank you so much bye. for doing this, guys. Bye. 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 Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.